Hello and welcome to Bloke on the Range. This is part two of the first episode of the 1889 rifle. Now, I'd originally intended to do one bigger episode, but once I sat down at my dining table, which is otherwise known as my well-appointed editing suite, I discovered that I had far more footage than I intended, but I didn't want to cut it. So, instead I've split the episode. Now, uh, you've already had the history and the adoption, Today we're going to do the mechanics and then I'll do an in-depth look at uh, the ammunition and some information on the trials cartridges that led to it in yet another partial episode. So anyway, all that has to be done now is to say the magic words and we'll bring the camera around for a closer look at the old girl. So let's start at the back and work forwards. So the first thing we've got here is a uh, straight hand stock, not untypical of the period leading to an incredibly, ridiculously long action. I mean, really massive. Possibly the longest bolt action ever put on anything, ever. Notice there the, uh, the cocking piece has a ring on it, which you can pull and twist to make the rifle safe. And then fire. And you can always, uh, he says, like that. You can uh, pull it back for a second strike if you need to. And also you can set this in the middle, which takes the spring tension off and is also the stripping uh, configuration. And we'll do that in a minute. Uh, in front of the trigger, there's a big gap and there's a 12 round magazine. Why 12? Well, the Vetterli had 12, it's what they knew. So why not? This does mean that the magazine is massive and it is detachable. There's a cutoff lever here which is really awkward to use. Pushed up, the magazine moves down and is cut off. Pushed down, the magazine moves up. You can see how that works there. And if I wrestle with this, it is not that easy to detach. A quick detach magazine, it is not. Ah, and it's stiff. We get the magazine out. Now, this is a double stack Lee type magazine. This massive reinforcing band goes around it to avoid it being damaged, as you'd expect a large magazine to get knocked about quite a lot. And then this cam track there interacts with, let's see if we can see in there, there's a little, there's a little stud on that lever there. And when you wiggle the lever, that brings the magazine up and down. And in a moment, I'll show you some advantages and disadvantages of that. So, it's a straight pull bolt. It cocks on opening, unlike a Ross. Yeah. And unlike most other um, straight pull rifles, it is an operating rod type. So in, in certain respects, this is kind of vaguely similar to a Lewis gun or an FG42 or an M60 in that you've got um, a stud on an operating rod that is alongside the bolt that causes something to turn by camming action. Now, uh, these aren't always all that slick and this one isn't exactly dripping in oil. Now what I can do is I can show you exactly what's going on by taking the spring tension off and by pulling down on the bolt release. Now this is, this here is the bolt release and it also helps keep the operating rod in one of the two end positions. Um, a lot of people presume that the bolt flops around in this position, but it doesn't. It's positioned by the magazine, uh, the, uh, the bolt release catch there and there. So actually, after you've fired, the first movement of of the uh, cocking handle backwards does quite a lot and it's a classic Swiss barrel type made of uh, some sort of uh, brown vulcanized rubber and these are often very very cracked and they shouldn't rotate like this but a lot of them do. Now the first bit of movement of the uh, operating rod backwards has to overcome the tension of uh, the bolt release and cock the striker. 
And I suspect that they went for cock-on opening simply because it's what they knew from the vetting. While it's doing that, let's take the spring tension off so we can see it better. There's a sleeve inside, but that, that sleeve there is rotating the lugs out of alignment and they have a rearwards camming action. So if you look there, you can see uh, the rear part moving backwards a bit. Now actually with the spring tension off, these are slick as, slick as a slick thing. And in fact, I can just, it's just with that engaged, there's an awful lot of, there's an awful lot of camming and moving stuff around. So uh, they don't always feel quite so slick in the use. So put that back there again. So cocking, unlocking, primary extraction, which is pulling, unseating the cartridge case from uh, the chamber, and then it comes back. Now, the front part of the bolt doesn't rotate. It's basically a cartridge rammer with an extractor on the top. And if I can get it around, avoiding the lights. And if you can see this on the screen, the ejector is just a little stud down there that is fixed and these eject upwards quite viciously. So if we put the magazine back in now, so that there is in the magazine on position. If I push it up, the magazine drops down. So actually, the point of this is quite clever. The initial doctrine was hold the magazine in reserve and single load, which is reflected in the design of the early pouches. And these were converted from Vettely pouches. And they're quite interesting in and of themselves. You've got 18 loops for individual cartridges and then a sort of stepped arrangement for um, for eight six round charges. Now these are dummy rounds. So the idea was you would load six, flick, 12, flick, 13. The manual says you should be able to do this in eight seconds, which from the pouch might be optimistic, but uh, we will let them have that. So you've got 13 rounds, and then it will operate as a single loader. The manual says that uh, 12 shots a minute single loading should be attainable as a normal rate, and with magazine fire, so pressing that down, bonk, they reckon on 20. They also claim that the mechanical, accurate, uh, the mechanical speed with which it can be operated theoretically is 40 a minute, but nah, I doubt it. I'm rather skeptical. So, rapidly, the single loading went out of the doctrine. So, these pouches were gone. And then we ended up with pairs of ammunition pouches, each of which holds two charges, so two there, two there, um, one on each side, 48 rounds total, which is uh, not an enormous number, but seems to be fairly, uh, not, not particularly unusual. And by about 1908, single loading was so long out of the doctrine that they uh, started putting these little uh, spring clip thingies onto the, uh, the cutoff arm to prevent you from accidentally knocking your magazine off because up is off and that is the most exposed position. Um, so if you were to knock against the front of a trench or something you could easily knock your magazine off, think you've got, you're getting rounds and you're just getting clicks. So they, uh, they're a bit of a pain to get on and off but uh, There you go, then you can't uh, accidentally turn your magazine off. Now, if you take the bolt out of the rifle with the cocking piece in the intermediate position, 
it practically just falls apart on you. Operating rod comes off. Then we unscrew the back piece. And we've got the locking sleeve and the bolt body. Now I'm not going to take this apart any further, it doesn't need it, but you can if you want to. Now despite the fact that this is quite a lot of pieces, it's actually relatively simple in operation. Now uh, here you've got the bolt head with a long extractor that goes all the way along. Groove along the bottom for the ejector stud to run in. This is the locking sleeve that uh, is what actually rotates to lock the bolt. And then the operating rod which just slides back and forth in its track to operate the whole thing. Now here we see the flaw in the design. The locking lugs are right at the back of the locking sleeve. So the distance from the bolt face to the locking shoulder is massive, it's the order of eight inches. Now, um, they discovered early on that while these are perfectly strong enough, and in fact they are strong enough, we know, to take a CIP 7.5 by 55 proof load because somebody made a boo-boo at the proof house or in sending some, some of these to the proof house in the UK a while back. Silly buggers. Um, what you've basically not got is enough margin of safety going on there. So a slightly blocked barrel is more likely to uh, cause a breech explosion. But you've also got a lot of springiness because you've got a lot of metal there that can be compressed by uh, the, uh, the case head thrust on the bolt face. So effectively, while there's pressure in the cartridge, this increases your head space somewhat, I don't know, so we could call this dynamic headspace. And um, if you've got a bit of a marginal dodgy case, bit of a weak case head, that could in principle burst on you. The other problem is that the, um, because this is right at the back, the pointy thing is there's very little material backing up the locking lug. It's really right at, right at the back. Now, I don't know what the main mode of failure of these is. I suspect it's actually case heads giving out because of the springiness of the bolt. But uh, one day we will do some experimentation to find out. Now, putting it back together is fairly simple. That goes together like that. That goes in there, screws back on. Now, these were fairly easy to armor, for the armorers to work on. So then we put we put the uh, various lugs from the uh, uh, operating rod in. This rear lug goes into this groove here. Front lug goes in there. That comes back. And then you can put it back in your rifle. Like that and then put it on safe or put it on fire, function check it, yes it works. So moving forward now to the barrel, now these are quite particular, they are three groove barrels and uh, what's really interesting with them is the, uh, the configuration of the throat, so the bit from the front of the, uh, well, just in front of the case. Now these dummies represent GP11, the conventional, so it would uh, behoove us to look at an original cartridge. Now, as I may have mentioned, there's a video uh, that I've done earlier, which explains the construction of these, but all we need to know here is that it's a uh, swage lead with a steel cap, paper patched over the lead, it's healed like a 22 rimfire, so the, uh, um, the diameter of the bullet just in front of the case mouth is wider than the inside diameter of the case mouth. And the bullets are 315, patched up to 321. So the chamber 
and the throat have to cope with this massive bullet that we're then going to squeeze down a bore that has potentially massive variation. Now, there's a lot of FUD law spoken about these and written about these, and some of the worst I heard was that these were a 304 diameter paper patched FMJ, which is just totally wrong. Forget the semi smokeless stuff, but that's just totally wrong. Now, the uh, land to land dimensions on this, they don't vary that much. They're about 296, 2965, 297 on a loose one perhaps, but the grooves vary massively. This particular one is 0.303 and a half, and uh, anything up to and including about 310 is absolutely typical. So potentially you're squeezing a 321 paper patch bullet down to 303, 304 uh, in the throat. So it's very difficult to film it with the uh, endoscope camera, but uh, I'll, put, I'll put it up in the corner and you'll uh, possibly see what I'm getting at. But basically, in front of the chamber, you've got this long, fairly gentle cone that squeezes the bullet down and, uh, and the rifling fades in fairly gently. Now, you can chamber and fire GP11 or use normal 308 diameter uh, modern bullets, but because of this uh, long and uh, wide initial part of the barrel, getting them to function well and accurate, accurately isn't trivial, and it's something I'm working on and we'll get there in the end. Now, while we're talking about the ammunition, let's just have a quick look at the charger. Now, this should be familiar to a lot of you. Um, but uh, what's all often not thought of is why the chargers are like this. Why not a Mauser type? Well, it's always good not to have to pay Mauser any money for royalties uh, on his patent. But the fact that they go around the bullet protects the paper patches. Now, these, uh, this ammunition is 1907, so it's 110 years old and the paper's quite brittle. But even when fresh, the, uh, the patches could tear against, uh, against the size of the pouches, um, could ruck up, and basically if it rucks up like that, you're gonna have to be forcing it into the chamber, you risk getting exposed lead, getting leading. So basically from the factory to the rifle, the, the bullets and their paper patches are protected by this cardboard and metal clip. They're also very, very, very slick to use compared to a Mauser type. Um, something we'll get onto a bit later when we compare with the, uh, the experimental Mauser type charger. Now, later in 1923 and 1924, there were batches of this ammunition made up, which is uh, GP90 slash 23. Not that much of it made. Uh, not that much of it seems to have been issued either. This book written in 1942 just mentions it without giving its name as um, smaller quantities of jacketed ammunition of later production. Now, if anyone has seen uh, a head stamp on this later than 1924, I'd like to know about it, please. Um, there's a small amount with 1923, but the vast majority of it that I see is 1924, like this one. And uh, this ammunition actually will go in any of the Swiss straight pulls, although obviously the ballistics will be quite wrong for any sighted for GP11. I suspect that that was the thought, but it seems from reading this book that the Orts Fair were being issued 30 year old GP90. Technically GP90 slash 03, but uh, who's really counting with just a primer being the difference. Now this book has a few interesting uh, diagrams in it. Here we've got a uh, machine shooting test of 24 shots in a minute uh, without any wind at 300 meters from uh, a G11 and from an 1889 with 30 year old ammunition because this is the 40s and the last ammunition was produced around 1912. And uh, you can see that it's about half as accurate. In fact, the figures here are a, a radius of 13.6 centimeters for the whole 24 shots for the uh, G11 and 21.7 
for all 24 shots for the 1889. Moving forward now, the sights are scaled from 300 to a very optimistic 2,000 meters, and they're not a, a tangent, they're a, uh, what would you, exactly what you'd call that type of sight, but uh, you, someone will tell me in the comments, but you've got a series of notches there every 100 meters. You've got a spring arm on the left with a thumb piece, and you press on that, set it to say 1,000, which is already kind of high. And um, you can, in an emergency, if you really, really need to knock it down, you can go thunk and it'll go down to the bottom, but don't, because it eats the crap out of these notches. Now, um, what's quite clever about these is that the sight is always positively indexed against the right-hand side, because this spring here is always pushing that way against the notches, which forces the other half of the leaf against that side piece. I think that's quite clever. Simple V-notch, very, very typical of the, uh, very, very typical of the era. And even though at the time, this cartridge compared to the, the Vetterli was a freaking laser beam, 1850 feet per second, much greater ballistic coefficient. But if you're at 300 meters, and you raise the sights to 400, you've moved your point of impact one meter, which is quite something. And just to put it in perspective with the uh, GP11 that came after, if you move the sight from 300 to 400, you move the point of impact 30 centimeters at 300 meters. So this has got three times the drop at relatively short range. Um, and in fact, if you, if you look at the aiming off tables, um, you're gonna be wanting to take a belt buckle hold in general, and uh, you'll be aiming up and down a lot at, uh, at longer ranges. In fact, it's probably individual fire beyond 300, beyond 300 meters is probably effectively impossible because you've just got to be so precise on the range uh, because the bullet's dropping like crazy. Now moving forward, there's a middle band with a proper swiveling swivel. And then at the front, we've got the, uh, uh, the front band, which is actually hinged. I'll take this off in a tick. Bayonet lug, stacking rod for making rifle TPs, and a muzzle protector. Now, these muzzle protectors are to avoid largely getting snow, ice, rain into the barrel are part of the reason why the barrel condition on a lot of Swiss rifles is so good. Uh, they didn't get rain down them on guard duty, they didn't get blocked with snow. The big issue is uh, getting blocked with snow or ice and then getting a breech explosion. Now the front sight is a barley corn with a flat top, again not atypical for the era, and is dovetailed into a slot so that it can be zeroed to the individual soldier. Swiss being a nation of marksmen, this is very important stuff. Now, what is also quite interesting, if we get up here, is that the barrel has a little bushing. It's brass in these, and in, uh, in the later rifles it's often aluminium. It's not a free float, uh, because it is in contact with the bushing, but there is play, and if the wood is not warped, it should, under its own weight, sit against the uh, whichever side of the bushing it's the gravity is aligned with. Ideally, that one. Now this is slightly warped, still shoots reasonably well for what it is, but you can uh, you can see the play there. But in a new rifle, it would be. Um, falling on its own weight against whichever side of the, you're holding it. Now, if we take the front band off, and the back band off, undo the sling,
never actually had this one apart. I don't, I'm not a systematic taker apart of rifles. There's a uh, spring clip here as well, so we can slide that forward. Take that, which is stuck off, he says. Sometimes a bit of persuasion is necessary. So I'm not a systematic taker apart of rifles. We can take the handguard off and see in all its glory, actually how advanced for its era it was. Now most rifles, and until quite a bit later, would be bedded, i.e. in contact with the wood, all the way down to the end of the wood. And it was really rifles like the SMLE that were starting to get away from this. And this is very much ahead of its era as a result. Now, it's in contact with the wood up to here. So it's uh, the, the wood to metal interfaces at the screws there, screw there, screw there, along the sides of the action, the underside of the action, and up to there. From there, it's free up to the bushing. And for the era, this is an absolutely excellent design. Uh, and they stuck with this until the K31, which they did a bit differently. And we'll get into that in due time. Now it's also worth noting that the uh, wood is serial numbered to the rifle, and if the serial number doesn't match, it's not Arsenal replaced wood. And if they replaced the wood, they renumbered it. There'll also be a similar number in the, uh, in the stock somewhere as well. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe, and please consider supporting us on Patreon so that we can keep bringing you uh, random old Swiss rifles like this one. So, next one in this series is the uh, Model 1893 Cavalry Carbine, and uh, so I hope to see you again with that one shortly. Bye.